Hey there, this video is about overheating and run times of the Sony a6700. So before I get into it, I just have to have a huge thank you to B&H Photo who lent me this camera to test and review it. So I just wanna recommend that you go check out B&H Photo for things that you might be looking to purchase. I buy most of my stuff from them and I always include links in the description. So big thanks to B&H Photo for helping me make this happen and share these tests and the reviews with all of you. All right, so first of all, why am I doing this test? Well, first of all, this camera, as most of you know, is a Sony FX30 in a smaller body. Now, the FX30 is a video-focused camera that has a fan and is very reliable because of that and has great thermal management because it has a fan. Now, when this camera got announced, there were a lot of, obviously, uh, videos about the camera and there was a lot of conflicting reports from YouTubers about run times and overheating and stuff like that. So. I don't get these cameras early, so now that this camera is actually shipped, this is not a pre-production model. This is what you would get if you bought this camera. I just want to share my with my results with everybody because I I just I think it's important that everyone knows the limitations of these cameras for shooting video. So with all of this stuff, there are so many different parameters and combination of tests that I can do. But what I chose to test, I think will give all of you a pretty good sense of what this camera is capable of in terms of shooting video. Now for all these tests, I shot all of them in 4K XAVC HS, which I think is the most common format that people shoot. I often use HS. And of course I had the auto temp setting set to high. And when I was doing this, I had it on a tripod, of course with the screen open to get the maximum amount of airflow and cooling capability of the camera. Now, when I did all these tests, they were done from a cold start. So what I noticed when I got the camera a few days ago, just sitting there and just going through the menu system and setting it up, not even recording, it was physically getting warm. Like the back of the camera, the grip, the camera was getting warm. And so keep in mind, these are all from a cold start. So if you are setting up a shot or going through the menus or anything like that before you start running, these numbers should go down. <laughs> so you will get less runtime. Uh, so first of all, did a couple tests inside the studio and then I also did some outdoor tests. So inside here in the studio, it's usually between 70 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit and the air conditioner is on here, so there's very little humidity. And so the first test I did in 4K24, the camera ran until the battery died at two hours and three minutes. And this is awesome for a couple reasons. One is it didn't overheat, it never had an overheat warning, and it ran for just over two hours, which in my opinion is a great performance for battery life. So that was awesome. Now, a lot of times people are wondering if certain cameras can be used in a YouTube studio or for long form content like podcasts or things like that, where you're setting up a camera inside somewhere and letting it run for a long time or longer interviews or things like that. So what I did then was test this with HDMI. Now, one thing I've noticed over the last several years with Sony cameras is that when you have an HDMI plugged into the camera, it tends to overheat quicker. And I don't know what the story is and why that happens, but I've definitely noticed this going back to when the a7 IV came out and I started talking about overheating and people didn't believe me. But one of the reasons was that when you have HDMI plugged into Sony cameras, they overheat faster. Again, I don't know why. So in the studio here, 4K24 with an HDMI monitor plugged in, it only ran for an hour and 11 minutes and then it overheated. So clearly there's something going on with HDMI causing the camera to overheat quicker. And again, this is really important because if you are using any sort of monitor while you're recording, or if you're sending out a signal for live streaming or a podcast, a lot of times I do podcasts remotely. So I'm sending out a stream to whoever I'm doing the podcast with and I'm recording internally in the camera. That's where the issue is. I think if you were doing just a live stream or using this as a webcam or something that where you're not recording internally, I don't think you're gonna have an issue with that. And probably, I didn't test this, but if you use the webcam feature in these cameras, uh, you know, usually don't have a problem with overheating. So the question is like, how do we make this better, right? Can we make this better? So I then tried this with the 4K24 with the HDMI and also using a dummy battery into the camera, trying to pull some heat out. And it did run for a little bit longer. I got an hour and 31 minutes. So a little bit improved but the overheat warning was on for an extended period of time in that towards the end of that. So I would be really nervous using that. And if any of you have used cameras that overheat, it's something that you're constantly thinking about while you're making content, when you should be thinking about making content or, you know, focusing on framing or, you know, directing or whatever you're doing besides worrying about your camera overheating. So the HDMI, as I said, causes the camera to overheat faster. And when I ran it again in the studio here without the HDMI, it ran until the battery died without an overheat warning. So if you have HDMI plugged in, you will significantly decrease the runtimes. Next, I did some higher frame rate testing. And 
It's kind of a weird test to do in my opinion, but it gives people a benchmark to sort of see what's going on with the thermals. So 4K60 inside in the studio here ran for 19 minutes until it overheated. This isn't really surprising, but uh, I just wanted to give that number because people are curious about how that works. And then I ran it in 4K120 and similar results here, it overheated in 18 minutes which again is you know, kind of what you expect with this sort of situation. Now, the reason why the, the 4K120 had similar numbers to the 4K60 is there's an additional crop in 4K120 uh, over just the normal APS-C crop that's in this camera. The next question you might have is about recovery time. Well, I ran the camera again in 4K60 and similar to the first time, I got almost 20 minutes until the camera overheated, but then I just turned the camera off for five minutes. I didn't touch anything. I turned it back on and I got an additional eight minutes of record time in 4K60. So I would say the recovery is okay. Um, and this was inside. So if you're outside, of course, it would be a different story. So, you know, there is a little bit of recovery there, but the camera was physically very hot. And one thing I want to point out here is all the times that it overheated or just ran for an extended period of time, like physically the camera was getting very hot around the grip and on the back of the camera. Uh, this is definitely for tripod use for sure. So how does the camera do outside? Well, I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I could have waited till peak heat of the day, you know, like, you know, early to mid afternoon, but I decided to test this out in the morning. It was probably mid to late morning. It was around 80 degrees Fahrenheit outside, fairly humid, like it usually is here in North Carolina. And I didn't want to give it a huge stress test because not everyone lives in a 95 degree Fahrenheit environment, but I thought 80 degrees Fahrenheit with some humidity was a good test. Now I did have the camera outside in the sun and the camera was sitting in the air conditioning all night. And when I brought it out, I set up as quickly as possible, turned it on and started recording. So it was as cool as I possibly could keep the camera and give it the longest possible runtime. And the camera was sitting out in the sun. When I did this test, it overheated in 22 minutes. So I didn't even bother testing 4K60 or 4K120 because of course those numbers would be even less. In my opinion, 22 minutes is not a great performance and this camera is not gonna be very reliable for shooting outside for any extended periods of time. Now onto my conclusion. So I was hoping for better performance out of the A6700, but unfortunately, this is pretty much what I expected. So I'm gonna make a conclusion here that this is more of a photography-based camera or a hybrid that can do some limited video. So if you're doing shooting outside, you can use it for short clips. If you're doing this, using it inside for medium to long form content, you're gonna to have to be more careful and more strategic about it. And you're gonna to have to really pay attention so that you don't you know, lose some footage. So like usual, if you are looking for a reliable video camera, I highly recommend that you pick up a camera that has a fan in it. And luckily, if you're looking for an APS-C camera from Sony that's a reliable video camera, I highly recommend picking up the FX30. It is very, very solid. So it is a little bit more money, but if you are using this camera for content creation, for client work, for videography, for anything where you don't wanna worry about the camera overheating and it's gonna be reliable, in most situations, get a camera that has a fan in it. More videos coming up about the A6700. Hope you enjoyed this. Thank you so much for watching. And if you did enjoy it, please hit subscribe. We'll see you in the next one.